This is a time-lapse video recorded by fluorescence information of blood cell clotting recorded by a colleague of mine um, in a mouse experiment. What you see in this video is this, 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 these funny waves of dynamic and really complex processes going on while forming a clot. The small green cells you see there are the smallest blood cells you have. They're also called thrombocytes. And they're the main contributors to form these clots. Next to the reddish colored cells, these are the immune cells, and they support uh, the clotting process. Blood cell coagulation is a super important and a super regulated mechanism. Why so? Um, upon injuries of your vessels, you need, of course, to prevent any blood loss. And that's exactly what these cells are doing. Now, when this, for, for, when, when this um, process is uncontrolled, we call this thrombosis. And thrombosis leads to complications such as a heart attack, a stroke, or an embolism in the lungs. If we can't keep this balance, we really suffer from grave consequences. And such consequences are related to the deaths we see worldwide. One in four deaths is actually related to a bleeding disorder. Millions of elder patients uh, who have been um, diagnosed with cardiovascular diseases are taking blood thinners to prevent this clot formation. And many more are actually at risk because of our Western lifestyle. Infection-induced thrombosis is yet another risk. You might have heard that Excessive blood cell clotting is a major problem in many severe cases of COVID-19. And that is exactly the topic I would like talk, to talk to you with today. And you probably also have heard that long COVID cases also are very much related to this excessive clotting phenomenon. And let's have a look what that actually means. What you see here are images, lung images, of patients pre and post COVID. On the left, you see a CT image of a lung which has a very high contrast with respect uh, to its environment. So it has a low X-ray density. That means this is a working lung. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see the lung of a severely deceased COVID-19 patient. High contrast, so a lot of X-ray absorption, and this patient, unfortunately, has lost most of its lung capacity. Such a patient requires an intensive care environment to survive. And um, um, because of the tissue damage, which happens after this massive infection, um, massive forms of thrombosis and inflammation occur, which increase even the risk uh, much more and causing also the fatal complications you unfortunately heard. Now the question is how you treat such a patient. And for clinicians, it is not only about treating or defeating the infection itself, but it is also to control the level of thrombosis so that you're not leading, you're not having a, 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 a patient which, which then suffers these fatal complications. The problem is that this form of a treatment under these extremely severe conditions is not simple. And um, what these clinicians need to do is basically to identify solutions or biomarkers which Ident uh, which gives them information early on before complications occur. Now, when the thrombocytes, these really small little greenish cells, are circulating in the bloodstream, they are always alert. They pick up, they exchange information, but next to controlling actually um, bleeding, they have tons of other functions related to the immune system, actually. In other words, these small cells a part of or have an extended role in your immune system, which complicates uh, the situation much more. And in a severely deceased COVID-19 patients, you have the situation that all of these functions are completely dysregulated. To give you a little bit of an idea what this problem actually is, let's have a quick look at the schematic. The schematic should just give you a rough idea what has been identified now over the past few years during the pandemic what intertwined and complex interactions you have between the immune system and the hemostasis system, which then leads to this massive thrombosis and to these fatal complications um, of what, what, we are, what we are observing. Now, 
obviously, if you want to have a, a simple answer for a very difficult clinical question, you need to have this one biomarker, but this doesn't really exist. And uh, the problem is, is um, which of these biomarkers could help us to early on understand um, that a condition is, is severely um, um, increasing and um, therefore being able to intervene before problems are occurring. So it's somewhat not surprising that finding a simple and a cost-effective answer for a basic clinical question is the hardest. Now, what happened during the pandemic is that hundreds of AI algorithms have been reported, trying to use the information of today's clinical biomarkers and to digest all of this complexity you saw in the schematic. But all of these algorithms failed miserably in clinical reality. So that indicates that there is some fundamental information missing. In fact, only three biomarkers used already for decades have been identified to somewhat be correlated to bleeding disorders in COVID-19 patients. And amongst those is, what a surprise, the concentration of single thrombocytes. But all of these biomarkers, again, fail to provide early on information before the complications occur. And that is exactly the point where we are now coming in. Because complications due to thrombosis is actually something you can, you can handle. Um, drugs against um, clotting is available, it's cheap. Um, and that means also that we can even personalize drug therapies if you would have the right biomarkers. Now, when you remember the video you saw in the beginning with this massive formation of a clot, um, the best chance what we have for a biomarker is the first and the initial step where the thrombocytes start to interact. This magic chit-chat was I, what I was referring um, um, before. But unfortunately, for these early stages where the thrombocytes kind of start to interact, we are actually lacking the technology to um, analyze uh, this, uh, this, this, this function of these cells. And this crucial time frame, this hopefully would happen way before the actual massive thrombotic clot uh, formation is actually happening. Now, to fill this gap, uh, my team and myself, we were trying to develop new methods to identify if there are biomarkers out there, and I'm referring already to the thrombocytes, and uh, fill this, this, this kind of a gap, this technology gap, to provide solutions for studying the interactions of these blood cells. To give you an idea how this looks like, have a look at this, 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 uh, water, uh, this glass filled with water. You see here a distorted image of a straw sitting inside. And this distortion of the image is related to a change of refractive index between the air-water interface. And exactly the same phenomenon is also what we are using for our methodology, which is called phase microscopy. But instead of uh, uh, glass filled with water, we are looking into low contrast cells, really small cells like these platelets, immune cells. And the platelets are just one or two microns or so in, in, in size. And we are also getting distorted images. Um, and we get them also because at a specific wavelength, the light is actually bent while it is uh, shining through these platelets. And the recorded image, which also looks kind of uh, distorted like this straw here, provides all the kind of information about the third dimension, basically the thickness of the aggregate, and therefore we can reconstruct all the cells uh, we are recording with our microscopy solution. Next to this, we had to ensure also that these weak and early stage um, interactions of the thrombocytes are not getting distorted by the way how we take the blood sample and provide it for the microscope. And so for that, uh, we are using a, a capillary, which is as thin as a single hair, and um, we are just diluting slightly the blood sample. And in this case, we can provide here a blood flow condition as the blood cells would experience it when they are circulating in our vessels. On top of that, which is even more important, is that we are minimizing the mechanical stress on these cells while they be traveling through, the, through this capillary so that all these interacting cells are not distorted. Now, 
Having a first prototype, we checked and uh, verified if um, the system is actually working. On the left, you see a video which has been recorded at a frame rate of more than 100 frames per, per second, and that allows us to analyze thousands of, seconds, uh, thousands of cells per second. To the right, you see exemplary images of these interacting cells, immune cells, platelets, and so on and so forth. We can resolve them up to um, the last little cell you can, you can think of. In fact, the one in the middle, this is this leukocyte, which has these funny ears on top. Um, this is actually a white blood cell where two platelets are interacting with the immune cell. So that means we have now technology which allows us to achieve high statistical power, so a lot of measurements of the different cells what we're looking at. And at the same time, we can do this without manipulating the cells at all within a short time frame. Now, the next step was obviously that we um, received samples from severely deceased COVID-19 patients from our clinic at Klinikum uh, München Rechts der ISA. And when we had now a look into these samples, you know, expecting that we would see something, uh, but still we were astonished. In many of those samples, and in extreme cases, um, we saw that more than 70% of all of the thrombocytes of the patients were not circulating on their own. They were all in aggregates, massive aggregates. But funny enough, they didn't look like the aggregates you saw before in the video. Not huge aggregates, but actually small aggregates. And that actually makes somewhat sense because the small aggregates um, are the ones which can, uh, which are not continuously filtered, um, sorry, the large aggregates are continuously filtered out either by your spleen or by your liver. And so this window of opportunity um, allowed us to see a very funny kind of an aggregation phenomenon which looks more or less like this. So you see here um, thrombocytes um, in, in, in microclots essentially. And most of these microclots had um, a size of less than five thrombocytes or so. And these um, small microclots can sufficiently circulate through the bloodstream and therefore they are accessible for our measurement which we are performing out of the, bod out of the patient's body in vitro. So this looked like that we have now a new marker, but at this point in time, you know, we didn't know if there's any clinical value for it. A clinician is not interested in information which is, uh, you know, driven by curiosity. A clinician is interested to improve patient management. That is the priority for him. And we needed to understand if this information, what we had, uh, what we now identified, um, would help us to better understand if this is the biomarker what we were looking for. So what we have been doing is, um, we also have been checking if um, we can measure these very small microclots very accurate. And what we actually observed is kind of a, a funny thing. So usually when you take a blood draw, you, you fill in these, these blood tubes with the sample. And um, what we saw is that time to result is of the essence for our small biomarker test. Meaning within 30 minutes or so after the blood draw, we saw that the concentration of aggregates was masked by some artificial aggregation phenomenon, some aging phenomenon happening in these blood tubes. In other words, what, our, what we need to do to have access to these biomarkers is that we need to measure the blood samples basically in the second it comes out um, of the patient body after the blood draw, at the bedside, at point of care. And that's exactly the strength of our technology because we don't need to manipulate anything. Um, we just dilute a little bit and then we measure and within two minutes of measurement time we have high st statistical power which allows us to completely analyze what is going on in the body of a patient. Now having these results, we went back to the clinicians, told them, you know, surprising, we see things what have never been uh, seen before and at the same time we can have a very accurate measurement. That made them pretty happy and they said, oh, it looks like that you really have now a biomarker of clinical relevance. And, you know, this is a compliment for, for a hardworking engineer, which you rarely hear, uh, because it is not that easy to develop really a new methodology 
um, in the field of medical diagnostics. Now, to understand and to get back to our hypothesis, the original hypothesis, if these thrombocytes, the activity of the thrombocytes have anything to do with the development of, um, of COVID-19 and they can tell us more about the severity of this disease, we were um, looking now into the patient samples um, from, from patients at an intensive care unit who were staying there for two to three weeks. And we were looking into the dynamics and uh, the changes of these microclot concentrations over time. And the results were the following. First, we observed and confirmed again that the concentration of these microclots truly correlated almost perfectly with the severity level of a COVID-19 patient. On top of that, and this is not the most important part, the rise of this concentration of microclots happened very fast and early on, way before fatal complications occurred. On top of that, we even saw that the composition of these microclots you saw on this slide before is also changing over time and correlated in size-wise size with the severity of the disease and actually many more parameters on top of that, which means with this type of biomarker, you actually can already start thinking about intervening before a complication occurs. And that is something what we currently don't have in such extreme cases. And most likely also relevant for anything beyond COVID-19. Now, this result um, was really and this demonstration of what our technology can do was, was welcome. Um, you know, COVID-19 patients, there were tons of COVID-19 patients over the past uh, few years, but um, COVID-19 is only, only one disease. Wouldn't it be cool if those biomarkers where we have now access to um, could also be uh, of, of support to, uh, of patient, uh, to support patient management in other diseases where thrombosis or dysregulation of the immune system is happening. For the moment, what we're doing is um, we are replicating these laboratory prototypes, what we are having here in um, Singapore and in Munich. And we do hope that we understand the full diagnostic potential of um, these new types of biomarkers um, for hospitalized patients suffering from sepsis, for example, or patients um, who require some monitoring during or after heart surgery. We also envision that for many of these um, non-hospitalized patients with diagnosed um, cardiovascular diseases or cancer patients which suffer from cancer-induced thrombosis could also benefit from a decentralized point-of-care measurement. So quite a portfolio with um, cellular chit-chat. And hopefully one day we can measure these um, functional blood cell information as simple as we do today, a complete blood count, a standard test you're having, for example, uh, with your family doctor or so. And in this way, support the patient management for some of the most prevalent diseases we currently have in the world and thereby improving the quality of life of millions. Thank you. Thank you.